All right, we're live and we are with the Commodity Report today and we got a special guest, Josh Young, today. Uh, really excited for this conversation. Uh, just want to lay out like a general thesis of what we are all thinking about uh, the macro landscape as it comes as uh, we're looking at energy, oil, gasoline and so on. So let's see where we're getting where we're uh, where we're all thinking here and then we'll go from there. But I'm really going to let Kevin and Josh kind of run the show today because this is super interesting. But to get you guys started out, big picture view, let's talk about oil. Um, what are you guys thinking about the oil markets? Do you guys think it's uh, something that's bearish, bullish? What are you guys thinking about the oil markets today? Josh, I'll kick it off to you. I'd love to get your thoughts and then I can follow up. Sure. So I noticed this morning um, almost every major investment bank has now gone bearish on oil. And um, you know, most of the banks don't have uh, prop trading so much anymore. I think I'm trying to remember which rule it was, but one of the rules after the financial crisis, they got sort of forced out of that over a few years. But it used to be amazing. You'd look at how the analysts would do, especially the macro sort of commodity analyst calls would do versus how the prop trading would do. And then these days you can look at like uh, Vidal and uh, Trafigura and so on, how they do versus how these bank calls do. And magically, the investment banks are these amazing contrarian indicators. They're wrong like 80% of the time. And yet these trading houses make money every year. And so in the investment banks used to make money every year trading uh, oil and other commodities. So, um, you know, when, when they're all on one side of the boat, it feels really comfortable being on the other side. So I, I actually feel even more comfortable being bullish here than I was prior to seeing this sort of almost conformity, unanimity that oil must go down and, you know, revise lower price targets by basically everyone on the street in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I would say, you know, the number one and, and nothing against them, but like Goldman Sachs is kind of the, the first ones to usually, uh, you know, either be the one to be the indicator for the top and, and the indicator for the bottom. Uh, and that's what I've seen over the last couple of years. So, you know, you kind of, so you're asking about the, the price action. All right. So price action is definitely bearish right now. I don't think we can deny that, but we are in, entering some areas of uh, potential support when you're looking at crude oil, right? And that's sitting at around the $68 level, $68 and 50 cents. Uh, and, and what you want to really see is, is some buyers actually stepping in and then also catching these shorts off guard. I know that we'll talk about the commitment of traders report, but we have seen an increase in managed money flows uh, on the short side here that I think is actually kind of putting in some pressure. Uh, and maybe just uh, trading off uh, of the technicals, that downtrend that we've been seeing here. Uh, what, I, what I actually am interested in over the next couple of weeks, if not months here, is the narrative really kind of playing out. What I find very interesting here uh, is either, uh, either the, the major agencies, if you're even looking at the EIA, OPEC, what have you, IEA, uh, either they're incorrect when it comes to some of their reporting, which that can be the case, um, or we have a, a bigger problem down the road here when it comes to the macroeconomic uh, landscape, not only just here in the United States, but also just maybe some of the weakness in China that might be uh, creating these uh, differences. And the reason why I say that, uh, and I always try to break it down really, really simply, right? You have what you're producing as an oil company, right? Uh, you have what you can actually put uh, throughput uh, within the refiners. And then obviously you have uh, energy demand or gasoline demand uh, just in general. And you really haven't seen a, a significant drop off when it comes to gasoline demand that's being reported right now, but you're seeing the price action reflecting that maybe demand is, is waning. Now, um, are we maybe seeing the unwinding of some of that geopolitical premium? Yeah, maybe. But in my opinion, there was only about maybe a buck, maybe a dollar fifty in that premium trade when you're looking at the Israel uh, Iran situation and what's actually happening in the Middle East, because, you know, when you're looking at the oil infrastructure, for the most part, it's been protected. Um, I, I feel like there is a disconnect somewhere. It's either we do have a slowing and it just has not been reflected in the numbers when it comes to demand, uh, or we have a significant amount of short selling that's taking place by managed money, which, you know, if you guys follow us in the, in the past, we kind of say, you know, usually managed money is wrong uh, over the longer term. And when, when, they, uh, when they do get it wrong, it actually can have a, a really nice little short squeeze. I just don't know where we're at. Now, I'm also concerned about the 200 week moving average. That's one I look at a lot. And we've been under that move average for uh, a considerable amount of time when you're looking at um, 
when you're looking at crude just in general, and then also when you're looking at like heating oil, it's been under that uh, that moving average for several weeks, actually almost about a month now, if I'm not mistaken, a month and a half, almost two months now. So um, all of that for me, when you're kind of looking at that 200 week moving average, the failure to reclaim that and push higher. And if you kind of overlay that with equities, uh, just in general, the S&P 500, or even if you're looking at macroeconomic data like GDP, um, usually that is actually a leading indicator that we have broader economic weakness. But once again, the data right now just does not align up. So I feel like something, somebody's off sides here. And maybe Josh can provide a little bit of color there. I know you and I, we have discussions going back and forth regarding the EIA data. Um, and I think you're, you're, you know, when it comes to the revisions and things of that nature, but I just feel like there's a, a disconnect. And if you're kind of looking at that risk reward ratio to the upside versus downside risk, um, you kind of look at it and say, okay, if we have a broader economic slowdown and we do have a pullback in the S&P, uh, this is going to be either your first indicator or if we're not going to have an economic slowdown, crude uh, oil in general in the energy products, maybe outside of heating oil, are completely oversold right now and, and a solid balance can take place. Josh, what are your thoughts around those those uh, those thoughts here? Yeah, I, I try to, to stay fundamentals oriented because I found that um, both technical as well as positioning, it's fun to talk about. And positioning, I think sometimes it's helpful for sort of shorter term bounces or explaining sort of shorter term movements. But I found that the eventually the price follows the fundamentals over, let's say, the medium to longer term. And so for, for my business, which is finding underpriced equities that have catalysts to revalue them, uh, it's more relevant for me. You know, the short term, it'd be great if I could understand it reliably, but sort of the longer term matters a lot more for the multi-year sort of price movement that I'm looking for in the in the equities. So from a fundamental perspective, like, like you were saying, Kevin, it's really this remarkable situation where price is moving down, but the fundamentals are looking better, not worse. And at the same time, as the price is moving down, the narrative is getting worse, right? You have these banks downgrading oil and lowering their price targets. You have these news articles about things that sound scary for oil, but then you look at the actual data they're pointing to and the actual claims. And for the most part, they're not that bearish for today's market. And you know, I really like following uh, Jeff uh, Jeff Curry, and he he makes this good point repeatedly. He was talking about this, I think, a couple of years ago when people were really worried about a recession that um, oil prices based on today's market, not based on what might happen in the future, because oil futures clear on a monthly basis. There's actually a physical clearing of some of these contracts, and so I think it's going to be really interesting to see the the disconnect between the current physical market and the sentiment and people trying to trade these sorts of potential moves in the economy through futures. And I think there's room for there to be this really big um, sort of reset in those future expectations based on the current market. So I think we're going to see sort of a, a test of that theory and at least sort of um, intuitively, theoretically, it sounds very compelling to me. So I think over the next couple of months, we're going to see, um, and then you can look at some of the satellite data and look at some of the revisions on the weeklies and so on, and, and things look pretty good. And I guess the two other things, and I think we'll get into more of this, one, um, I think the, the narrative around OPEC and some of this other stuff has gotten very, very negative as prices have moved down, where their actual activity has gotten very positive. And then, again, from an inventories perspective, and also from a drilling activity perspective, things just keep getting better for oil, not worse. And it sounds so weird as to say that as prices are falling, but you can look at demand, Kevin, like you were saying, and look at supply, like I'm talking about, and look at trajectory in terms of drilling activity, wells coming online, even like the most avowed oil bearers, they claim that activity is flat, but then they show numbers showing that wells coming online in the US for shale, which is sort of the marginal supply for oil, um, are down significantly in the last couple of months. And if that trajectory continues, you'll have even fewer wells come on, which should challenge supply even more. So again, it's sort of one of the biggest disconnects I can remember. Um, in investing in oil and gas for the last roughly two decades. So it's pretty, pretty amazing to me. And uh, it's going to be one of those questions, I think, where, hey, is the truth in this 200 day moving average that you're talking about is the truth in the technicals? Um, or is the truth in uh, the data 
and the drilling activity and the fundamental demand in that trajectory. So you brought up a really good point there, Jason. I sent you a chart, um, if we could cue that up. I know I'm always late. So you brought up a really good point when it comes to the, like, once again, so gasoline demand is actually higher this year than it was in, in 2023, right? And at this point in time, um, we were trading at, what, 86 bucks and some change uh, this time last year. Might be off about, uh, yeah, no, we were, yeah, we were trading at around... 93 bucks, right? So you have higher demand. Um, and then when you're looking at the inventories themselves, um, you know, especially when you're looking at US inventories and compare them to a five year moving average, I mean, we're still on a relatively like low basis uh, taking place here and global inventories has not risen um, as aggressively. But when you're talking about these energy companies and what I want to kind of get to is this crack spread. So we have a three, two, one crack spread, high level, take three barrels of crude, uh, making two barrels of gasoline, one barrel of, of diesel, heating oil, whatever, right? And there's several different crack. There's like 20 of them uh, that you can see on the CME website, right? So we won't get all in all of those intricacies, but we're trading right now at around $15.21 for that crack spread. And Josh, I mean, it's the lowest level that I see. Actually, we we actually cleared another, another hurdle, but I believe it's the lowest level we've seen in like three years uh going on four years actually the last time we saw these levels were in yeah february 2021 uh when you're looking at these energy companies and you're trying to evaluate this knowing the landscape that we're in right now is this ultimately bearish or or, or bullish when it comes to energy companies or even just the energy markets uh because that spread kind of signifies that margins especially when you're looking at the refiners might be getting squeezed here a little bit um, and and you can make a case that maybe a lot of these companies, like the major integrated, like the Exxon's, the Chevron's, that have seen passive flows coming in because globally um, the S and P five hundred, you know, risk off sentiment, we tend to see the uh, flows going in utilities and energy companies. But uh, right now, is a massive divergence between the two. So, what are your thoughts when it comes to the crack spread, the collapse of the crack spread? I'll even call it a collapse because it's actually drive, uh, dropped um, significantly since the highs. The highs this year we were sitting at. Uh, what around uh, 32 bucks? We're, we're, we're half that right now, more than half that. Yeah, I think I think it's great that you brought this up. This is one of those sort of very interesting stories. So let's start on the oil price implications of this, and sort of the narrative versus reality, and then let's get to the energy stocks. At least again, from my perspective, um, is purely my analysis and opinion, and you know, people shouldn't rely on this and figure out sort of their own their own approach for investing and and take their own risk and consult their own advisors. But the way I see this is that refining margins had been and have are intermittently good signals for the oil price and for oil market either weakness or tightness and so historically there have been times where refining margins have fallen and that's a signal that demand is very weak and therefore oil prices are going to stay low or go lower so that's been sort of a heuristic it's been a signal people have used and i've noticed the macro oil analysts that are most focused on refining and have backgrounds in evaluating the refining companies or have just come out of that sort of space are the most bearish that I've seen, or sort of especially the ones that are not sort of perma bearish, um, are the most bearish oil here and have been sort of the most bearish for a little while. But it's sort of a weird thing when you think about it. If you, if you step away from oil just for a second and just think about what it means for one part of a value chain of anything to be oversupplied um, and for the price of that thing in a value chain to fall, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the demand for the overall thing um, is necessarily bad. And it doesn't necessarily mean the price for the overall thing necessarily needs to go down. So one sort of analogy, and it's imperfect, but I think it's worth considering is imagine if there were two new steering wheel manufacturers, or sorry, two new steering wheel factories that were opened up by existing steering wheel manufacturers. Let's say there's 10 suppliers to you know, the, the global uh, auto market for steering wheels, and you add, let's say, two new factories, and you add, let's say, 5% capacity to steering wheels, but existing auto trends stay where they are. So if you increase supply by 5% of steering wheels, but 
let's say auto demand only increases by 1%. So the price for steering wheels is going to collapse. And if you were evaluating the auto market based on steering wheel pricing, you would say, oh my God, there is car Mageddon right now, right? Cars are going to, demand is collapsing because uh, steering wheel prices have collapsed. But this is clearly an analytical error because the price of steering wheels has collapsed because there are too many new steering wheel factories. And again, I know this is an oil discussion, so let's mm-hmm. bring it back to oil. So it's not that there's necessarily too much or too little oil. It's that this part of the value chain refining has seen substantial capacity additions over the last few years. And it's actually hard to tell exactly how many new refineries there are because there's all these teapot refineries in China and there's sort of intermittent utilization of this new large refinery in Nigeria. Uh, I always mispronounce it, uh, uh, Dangot or Dangoti. I I, I forget sort of the right pronunciation. I think there's like an English one and then a Nigerian one. It might be slightly different. So I apologize if I mispronounce that, but that's roughly a million barrels a day. And it could actually, I think, be a little more or a little less. And then there were all these issues with refineries during COVID and then restarting after COVID where utilization was artificially low because there were lots of, there was lots, lots of capital expenditures uh, and, you know, repairs that were deferred and then there were explosions and fires. And so utilization was artificially low. So suffice it to say, I think that crack spreads are best understood in the context of a steering wheel supply glut rather than an auto supply glut as the analogy. And I think it's a analytical error to rely on them too heavily for an indicator of uh, crude market demand or lack thereof. And I think the thing to really worry about would be if prices fell so low that refiners were forced out of running if their margins went negative, which they're not. And certain refineries might be slightly negative, but most of them are not. So again, from an oil market perspective, that's how I see this. And I guess I'm curious about your take before we get to the the energy equities in terms of the, the crack spreads. Yeah, no, I, I'm right there with you. Yeah, and I would we definitely should have pro- provided a little bit of disclaimer before. Um, usually, like when I talk about energy markets, right? We're talking about a a week, two weeks, maybe even a month out, right? And you have a longer term view. So sometimes we can, we could disagree on on some of the minutia, but I think the end, the end goal is is still the same when it comes to the majority of the views. Um, I'm I'm right there with you, right? If you're going to bring on more uh, refining capacity, you're just bringing in uh, more supply. Um, And we've had a healthy amount of supply activity, not only when you're looking at extraction, but when you're looking at throughput uh, from these refiners. And that might have a little bit of a downward impact when it comes to um, the the, the finished goods. What what I, once again, usually I'm, I'm like, super confident in my in my convictions here and i'm just a little bit puzzled uh because once again we have just this breakdown in price compared to what the fundamentals are kind of uh showing and and obviously you're kind of talking about also on the international scale i think one thing too the market may have gotten a little bit ahead of itself and i know i'm one of them as far as the china reopening story right like we just have not seen that boom um as aggressively as i think uh the, the market was expecting uh and i think the market was also expecting, and I was not on this one, was expecting a huge draw from China on the international scale when it comes to global inventories. And that's just like, that's not the case. China actually has a pretty robust um, uh, refining network uh, within its own country. And they actually did build up their stockpiles, you know, post COVID and even kind of actually like lingering po- uh, after COVID. So it, you didn't have to have that much of a draw. And then they have, uh, you know, new supplies or getting you know, more supplies from countries like Russia and things of that nature. But, um, once again, I, I, I'm at a little bit of a, a crossroads here. Like either, either the market's going to rip hard and rip face, right? We're going to have this huge short covering event, um, or we have a, a bigger problem within the, the the U.S. economy at least, and or on the global scale. Um, let me go and ask you uh, two things. So I, I want I want to make sure I hit both of these. So when you focus on companies, um, there's extraction, right? There's upstream, midstream, downstream, for those that really don't know. And maybe you can kind of uh, provide some color on this, but the upstream kind of being the extractors, the midstream being those refiners, those that process, and you have downstream, right? Getting to uh, retail or the the finished user. And one of the things that I've seen here, especially uh, on a day like today, we have gasoline trading at $1.90, give or take, when you're looking at gasoline futures. Now, gasoline futures are not gonna be a one-to-one to what we see on the retail side. Uh, 
But are you kind of looking at the the downstream players and saying, hey, maybe there's an opportunity there? Because when you're looking at the AAA um, national average for gas, and there's probably better data sets, but this is probably one that a lot of people do watch. Um, gasoline prices this time last year were, were the same, even though prices have pretty much collapsed when it comes to gasoline. Do you find like there might be a fundamental uh, value area when it comes to downstream players because of those uh, because of this disconnect, or maybe is there an arbitrage there, or do you think those are you know two mutually exclusive uh, things that are, are kind of going on within this space? Because it, it looks like it for me that downstream players just knowing the input costs have gone down to significantly. Um, at the tail end of the summer season, seems like somebody is making a decent margin on here, and it doesn't look like it's the refiners. Maybe it's the downstream players. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so so I think normally when people talk about this, they include both the refiners and the gas station owners in that sort of downstream, and then midstream is sort of more I think the the pipeline sort of uh, companies. So um, I think the refiners you're seeing their profits getting squeezed in that crack spread that we just looked at. So and again. And that's just the three, two, one is just one of, of many uh, potential crack spreads, depending on uh, you know the the specifics of the refiner as well as the specifics of their crude input. This is sort of more of an average and just a sort of high level heuristic rather than the exact uh, numbers. Um, I did see that gas station margins were temporarily higher, but gas stations are sort of tough businesses, and they're sort of more. Um, as I understand it, most of the time they make very little money on their gasoline and they make their money on selling cigarettes and alcohol and uh, convenience store items. And the best performing gas stations that I've seen have been the ones that have been able to sort of uh, trans transfer sort of more into like a 7-Eleven style, or in some cases, there's one that's sort of like well-known, I forgot the food item or something, but there's- uh, Casey's, yeah, the pizza, Casey's. Yeah, there's two items yeah. that bring in people to individual specific branded gas stations and stuff, which is amazing, but that takes you really far away from, I think, the, uh, the oil world and um, is a very difficult thing for me to evaluate. And then also valuation-wise, those gas stations, especially because of this transition and because of the sort of value added on the branding side the valuations on those have been pretty high and then you know buffett went and bought one of the um truck stop companies a few years ago and i think that sort of um i i think i'm remembering 15 times uh, earnings it might have been a little higher a little lower but it was a, a pretty high valuation people were surprised because they thought that meant that um you know, I think people were worried that trucking would sort of go away and that demand for diesel would go away and therefore people would pay very low prices for these things. And I think that's the opportunity Berkshire saw. I'm trying to remember, it, it might've been travel centers or it might've, I don't remember the, the name of the, the particular company that um, that Berkshire bought. But uh, so, so I think there's that opportunity maybe for the gas stations, but again, for them, it's more about, I think this sort of transition to being branded convenience stores and other, you know, uh, sort of fast food restaurant sort of uh, things. So I think, I think that's a tough place for me to have a real view on. Um, I will say sort of on China, as well as on US demand, um, there are sort of two specifics that are not economically driven um, that are worth noting that I think are messing up the demand data. So in the US, there were enormous uneconomic subsidies to turn cooking oil and in some cases pre-use cooking oil. So basically taking food away from the restaurants and uh, ahead of being used and sending it right to biodiesel. And so biodiesel demand has been really high because the processing of it has been heavily subsidized. And then I think there have been some heavily subsidized uh, sales as well, or, or incentives to, to either buy it or for the gas stations to sell it. And then in China, there's been a shift towards using um, natural gas powered trucks, which ironically gets back to that Buffett bet, hey, what happens if that happens here? We'll see, but it hasn't happened yet so much. It was sort of T. Boone Pickens and Aubrey McClendon, they had this view, like this vision sort of 20 years ago, and that didn't play out, but it is playing out right now in China. And so you have these sort of two distortions where demand has actually been pretty good, except that in China, they've ramped to some extent the truck demand for natural gas, which has eaten into demand for diesel in China. And then in the US, there's been this substitution of biodiesel. And again, it doesn't, it's not perfect, right? Because that still takes away from the demand for oil. But if you look at it as sort of all uses of energy and then sort of how much of the market's really going to get cannibalized by that, sort of how realistic is the growth that you've seen in liquefied natural gas uh, powered trucks in 
China or how how much more growth are we going to see in biodiesel? I think both of them are constrained by various factors. I think we've sort of seen it looks like famous last words, but we've seen what looks like the bulk of that sort of um, consumption shift. And so when you look at the holistic picture, it looks great. And then when you net out those two specific things, uh, you I think understand some of that temporary weakness. And then when you look at the ordering trends for trucks, for diesel powered trucks, as well as the actual movement away from biodiesel, diesel from some of these biodiesel refiners, where you've seen in a couple of cases, they're actually shifting. Having done the conversions to biodiesel, there are a couple of them, it looks like, I, I think I saw announcements where they're actually shifting back to regular diesel refining. And then there's a number of projects that were either in the works or planned that are getting mothballed or you know delayed uh, on that biodiesel front. And so I think, I think we've sort of seen the bulk of both of those. And then that sort of gets you more comfortable, I think, in terms of what's the supply demand picture and where is it going. I think it's a lot less bad. And I think the sort of risk in straight lining these sort of demand or even expecting acceleration of demand destruction or you know, substitution in China from these liquefied natural gas powered trucks and then in the US from biodiesel. In, in the U.S., especially the biodiesel replacement that you can sort of see, it's actually the, the pendulum swung too far and it's actually shifting back. Um, so I think I think it's helpful to sort of look at the specifics of these markets and better understand where that demand is gone and if it's coming back or not. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of shifts, right? <laughs> it seems like over the last four years, you know, you could even say last eight years, we've had uh, a huge uh, shift when we started with uh, what solar and wind, uh, and we're going to get broader energy, right? Solar and wind, now it's kind of maybe relying a little bit more on the natural gas front. Um, the scaling up of LNG uh, refiners, and I'll ask you, actually ask you about that too, the LNG regasification um, and um, expansion of that infrastructure seems like that's going to be a little bit more of a longer term vision here um, for the United States, maybe. Um, what is your, I had something else, you brought up Berkshire, let me bring, let me bring this up real quick and then I want to ask you about LNG. Um, Berkshire is trading at 52, is, is Warren Dunn? Is Berkshire done trying to pick up Oxy right now? Or um, you think this is once again, just kind of an overdone level and, and you can maybe give us some insights into your thoughts about the fundamentals around Oxy in general. So, so there are a number of different perspectives on Berkshire buying Oxy in the first place. I happen to actually have been at that Berkshire meeting where they first talked about their Oxy position. I almost fell out of my chair when I heard about to talk about it um because i'd done a lot of work on it and i didn't own the stock and i don't own the stock but i look at it really closely and i know a number of people that work there or worked there i had seen different transactions that they had done and sort of gotten to know i think some of their strategic positioning and sort of what was going on that was working and not versus sort of what the narrative was and so um my read on it was just that oxy was a it, it was sort of the most levered oil producer bet that Berkshire could make in 2022 when oil prices were ripping um, after Russia invaded Ukraine. And, and you know, the timing of their purchases, I, I think from memory, they only started buying after oil prices ripped, but then and then pulled back a little. I think they started buying in either March or April of 2022. But there were sort of two oil price spikes in 2022. And I think they bought after that first one started to fall off and after Oxy stock has started to fall. Um, af after that sort of initial spike after Russia invaded Ukraine. So my take on it, based on looking at almost every investment Berkshire and Buffett personally and Munger personally pre-Berkshire had made in oil and gas uh, equities and on the private side, um, that this was purely a levered bet. You know, they talk about liking the management team, but the management team leaves a lot to be desired. They came extremely close to going bankrupt during COVID, which is amazing because of the strong balance sheet the company had prior to the current CEO coming in. So she led the sort of damage to their balance sheet. Um, and, you know, the buck stops with her. And so um, I think. I think it makes sense in evaluating the company as well as management, sort of what changes she made to the company. So anyway, levered bet on oil, arguably low quality management. Berkshire sort of Buffett did the best he could to sort of like make it sound good. But the reality is that he lent the company a bunch of money and made a ton of money on it. And before he started buying the stock, he was actually a seller of the stock at a fifth of the price in the market when he got common shares paid 
as a you know a dividend in kind rather than getting paid cash by by Oxy. So um, it's not so surprising to me that oil prices would fall and Berkshire would eventually stop buying Oxy, which is consistent with my view that it's sort of this levered bet on oil. It doesn't mean that they won't come back in and buy more of it. It's just that when you look at the valuation for Oxy, and again, people should sort of come up with their own views on this and, and make their own investments this is just my personal opinion, and you shouldn't rely on it. But when you when I look at Oxy and I look at sort of the comp sheets and look at the analysis that people do on it and how they rationalize uh, Buffett's investment in it, um, it doesn't look that cheap. And a lot of the arguments like the, um, the extracting CO2 out of the air unconnected to power plants or anything, just, you know, doing the extraction purely just having a facility out in the middle of nowhere that extracts uh, CO2. Um, these are things that are not economic. Yeah, there's subsidies for them, but they make no sense engineering wise. Uh, it is exciting as an energy investor where it's sort of a perpetual motion machine. If you can burn natural gas to go extract CO2 using one of these direct air extractors of CO2, I mean, you're going to need an infinite amount of energy because you can barely extract enough CO2 to offset the energy produced to do the extraction. So that sort of business to me, it seems very low quality and very dependent on government in involvement. Um, so that's what I think about it. I think it makes sense. Buffett hasn't been buying it here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he starts to buy it, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he starts to buy it a lot lower than where where it's trading, given sort of the history of the business, the history of his investment in it, and the long history of Buffett and you know now now deceased Munger's uh, investments in oil and gas companies over the last what is it 50, 60 plus years. So let me follow up because you uh, focus on a lot of the the shale plays, um, obviously, right? And that's been a huge you know um, news driver over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, the United States, what's being reported is that we are the number one producer in, in oil right now, um, and that's also being attributed to the expansion of shale in, in some respects. Now. Uh, well, let me ask you the first question. Do you think we might be seeing some signs of um, peak production when it comes to shale? I think I've seen a post, maybe a post from you around that. I wanted to kind of get your thoughts. Yeah. So, so, so first of all, I have a mea culpa. Like I've been wrong on what would happen with shale for a lot of the last couple of years based on what I saw happening versus what happened subsequent to what I saw are sort of changes. So just to be clear, I thought that shale was peaking a couple of years ago and I was wrong and shale production is up since then. Um, and it's important, I think, when you get something wrong to identify it, acknowledge it, figure out where you got it wrong, and then you know, have a lot lower level of confidence, but also um, be able to sort of recalibrate. So um, what I think is happening right now is not that shale is peaking forever. And you see some of these sorts of claims uh, from folks that were also wrong two years ago and five years ago and seven years ago. And again, I think it's important to recalibrate. Um, so there have been a couple of changes that drove that incorrect call. So one is these horseshoe wells. So basically, instead of just drilling a well, you, you drill down and then horizontally in shale and then complete the well with a multi-stage fracture stimulation of the rock. Um, instead of just drilling down and then horizontally, there's a, a new technology or a new sort of technique that's being used where people drill down, drill horizontally, and then are able to turn around underground and drill back the same way. So you can get twice the length on the same sort of amount of lease acreage that you have the rights to. And so that's dramatically cut drilling cost and increase the amount of tier one acreage that's available because if you're going to have let's say a 70 dollar break even on a one mile lateral if you can make it a two mile lateral and cut 30 percent off your cost per foot of shale you know horizontal that you're exposed to um you now have maybe a 50 dollar break even and so as that technique has sort of gotten rolled out and better accepted, and now there's a couple of years of production history, that's sort of shown that there's sort of more inventory. And then the one other thing that we've seen is companies have sacrificed their remaining inventory in exchange for better production. So not just doing these horseshoe wells, but also if they could put, let's say, eight wells per square mile um, and, and you know, in different zones and be able to get 
again, break evens at let's say $70 oil, again, just using the oil price as sort of the, the variant and the, the natural gas and natural gas liquids as sort of a stay flat just for, for the purpose of this. Um, if they go from eight wells to four wells on that land, their break even might go from 70 also to 50 or 45 or 55, somewhere in that range. And in many of the zones and many of the remaining locations in the Permian, it's not a question of what's the rate of return. It's what's the rate of return subject to how many wells are drilled on the land. And so both of those, when you better understand those trade-offs, um, I think it really helps explain sort of what happened, which is companies took their inventory and said, hey, instead of having 20 years of stay flat inventory at $70 oil, I'll have seven years of stay flat inventory at $50 oil. And by the way, I'll go and focus only drilling on that. I'll spend the same amount of money I was planning on spending, and I'll actually grow a little instead of staying flat because these wells are so much better. So that's what's been happening. So eventually you'll end up running out of these best locations and maybe the technology will get better and the techniques will get better or maybe you'll just be out and you'll see production collapse and you know you've seen that in many fields and eventually eventually that'll happen in the permian but i think there's still another leg up of production growth i just think you need a lot more rigs i think you're sort of burning through this set of technology improvements and drilling technique improvements, as well as um, you know, through the upspacing, you know, drilling fewer wells per section, you're, you're burning through that really fast, and there isn't an obvious next offset for that. And so I think you're going to need much higher prices, which is where I'm bullish, sort of medium to longer term, because I think the world needs this particular oil incremental source, and you're going to need much higher prices to induce the next set of rigs which are going to go drill worse wells that need a higher price just to break even. And you're going to need these companies that look amazing because they're drilling half as many wells and producing just as much or more. Um, you're going to need them to agree to essentially look less amazing by going and drilling worse wells at a higher break even uh, with less productivity. And so I think that requires much higher prices. So anyway, that's the shale dynamic as I see it. I know I sort of rambled there a little, but I think that's sort no, of the, it's great. important to sort of see where the narrative went wrong and what's happening now. And again, that's not the consensus at all. And that's part of what's so exciting to me about these investment banks going bearish oil here is that I think they're making this analytical mistake of thinking that, hey, if, if you add a bunch of rigs, which many of them have these forecasts for rig additions in the next 12 months, that you're going to get the same drilling efficiency and there's almost no one in the industry that thinks that, but almost all the investment bank thinks that. And you know, I think I'm going to go with the industry guys over and, and my own analysis of this situation over the investment bank. Um, sort of, it's almost like they're sort of straight line extrapolating rather than understanding the nuance of how we got here to be able to better understand where we go from here. So uh, let's talk about the the Permian once more here. So let's set the stage. Two weeks ago, Reuters had a report. It was on the August 29th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they had a report that, uh, what, six members or six delegates or what have you, uh, some of their sources, six sources were looking at uh, OPEC uh, plus basically um, resuming uh, production or trying to increase production levels, uh, potentially starting in October. Uh, and then we had another report last week kind of undercut that narrative or, or stating that there's now an agreement to really kind of pause on those uh, production increases, at least uh, for the next two months or so um, as prices try to rebound or at least catch their footing here. Um, obviously, there's a lot of politics that go into that. So I, one thing to just kind of note, if you're a viewer, when you get these reports, take them with a grain of salt. You, you, you know, people are going to trade on them. But uh, as we get closer and closer to the official meeting, which is going to be the first week of October, I think it's like October 2nd or something like that, you'll probably continue to see this back and forth. There's a lot that's going on within OPEC+, Plus, especially the smaller countries that want to start ramping up production because it's hurting their, their GDP not to do so. And then, you know, you have the, the bigger uh, countries, the bigger influencers like uh, Russia or even a Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, what have you, um, that uh, kind of want to stabilize production right now the reason why i bring this up i want to get your thoughts on that story and the, and the turnaround there and that being one of the major catalysts and one of the catalysts maybe for this downside price action move and two 
Do you get concerned that we might have a 2013, 2014 type of moment uh, where OPEC and OPEC Plus basically say, okay, we're, we're done with the Shell uh, um, expansion story uh, and, and we need to start trying to potentially flood the market and try to collapse margins again and try to reclaim some market share? Do you think that that's something that could be possible out there? Is that in your your view? Um, yeah, I'm not saying happening tomorrow, but you think that that narrative starts to creep into their thoughts over the next year or two years because of the, the rapid expansion that we are seeing with shale and the improving uh, technology that's made it a lot more for, efficient over the last couple of years? These are great questions. So I think the, the right background for understanding any news report about OPEC is that there was a falling out between OPEC plus somehow and some of these major news organizations. So there's, there's some personal animosity between the OPEC members, like both the countries, I guess, officially, oddly, but really like the energy ministers of these countries and their OPEC representatives and specific reporters at specific major news organizations to the degree that OPEC, I think it was a couple of years ago, officially uninvited a set of reporters to their meetings. And again, they're televised, they're, you know, whatever streams. So it's not like they're really missing out too much, but they're not able to go ask questions, which is considered important. But I think it's really important to understand that context, as well as a history of um, very spotty reporting, where, you know, there were sensational articles and news reports about OPEC in the last few years um, that were um, at least partially untrue, and that, you know, I think were sort of odd to observers where it was sort of curious how it made it through editorial review, some of these news stories, given just how ve vehemently they were um, opposed. And then when, when more color came out, it turned out to be sort of a very, very misleading headline or story or so on. And, and it's one of those things where this the o OPEC uninvited these folks, and then they just kept doing more of these sorts of stories. And so, um, for example, there were stories about OPEC dissent and how there were OPEC members that were really unhappy with, with each other and how supposedly, like you were saying, OPEC was falling apart like 2013 and 2014. <laughs> that happens every three years, it seems like, right? That seems like that story comes up. No, it, it comes up every six months or so. <laughs> and, and this particular one, it appears in retrospect, was driven by Angola leaving OPEC. But Angola left OPEC, as far as I can tell, because they were so totally embarrassed by missing their quotas. You know, people talk about OPEC cheating in terms of, of countries, you know, producing more than their quota. Angola had really big problems, uh, reservoir wise and governance of the companies wise and governance of the country. Like, just, just a, they had real challenges. And they missed their quota every year for a bunch of years. And Eventually, OPEC was going to reset their quota down, and Angola had plans, as they always do. Oh, we're going to grow. It's sort of like uh, some of these countries; they have these big plans, and then every year they, they they announce the plan, and every year they miss. They have these like porcupine charts, they call them, where it's like always oh, supposed to grow, and then oh, you reset down, and oh, you're supposed to go and reset down every year. So it's airline um, companies they do that all. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, a number of these news stories, they were claiming this sort of OPEC descent and, oh, OPEC is falling apart, when in reality, what they were actually capturing were these couple of countries, uh, Angola included, that just couldn't meet their quotas. And they were very mad. And so they were saying things to reporters or whatever. But again, it just shouldn't have made it through editorial review, or the stories should have been massively toned down by their editors, and they weren't. And so, um, you know, it made things really complicated if you're just trying to figure out what's going to happen, because you have this sort of weird, weird stories from large news organizations that are generally very reliable. Um, and then, um, you know, weird stuff from OPEC, where they also have had stuff It's very, I mean, they had a over 2 million barrel a day demand estimate for this year. Honestly, I went into the year thinking, hey, you know, IEA is usually wrong, OPEC's usually right. Um, and OPEC must have some orders or something from China or somewhere else to have this sort of high demand estimate. And lo and behold, they haven't, at least so far, you know, it's been more than half a year and they've been very wrong. And, you know, I was wrong to think that OPEC would be right. I, I don't really understand how it's possible for them to have been this wrong because they do get advanced orders for their oil ahead of sort of these disclosures and they do set their sales prices. These various OPEC plus countries, especially the largest ones, do get to set their sort of uh, prices 
And famously, Aramco does this with their, you know, they have a different price for each different market that they set every uh, month or quarter. And so um, it's very weird that they were this wrong, but they were, they, I think, also sort of had these credibility issues. And I've written about them having issues with their claims on spare capacity. You know, Matt Simmons, I have his book up on the wall, like he pointed out the just absolute ridiculousness of their reserves claims, where you had they, they would basically keep their reserves static as they would produce their oil, but oil is a depleting resource. So if you don't have new discoveries to point to, you probably don't have as many reserves today as you did a year ago, right? You need a technology improvement or a discovery to add reserves. You don't just magically add reserves as you deplete them. Either you understated the reserves before or you're overstating them by not you know, re- writing them down. So there's a, a very basic, famous credibility issue for OPEC. So that's the context for it. And I think it's important because it answers the second question, which is, look, I think OPEC knows they have a credibility issue. I think they're trying to navigate a very challenging thing, which is, you know, being a cartel without sort of the threat of a real threat of physical violence between most of the members um, means that it's a very, you know, there's always this tension. You're always going to have a small amount of cheating. And Given that, I think they've actually navigated things extremely well, minus the Saudi lollipop cut. Saudi cut an extra million barrels a day and created all kinds of problems for themselves last year. That was dumb and predictably dumb. And it seems like they almost sort of like made it up on the spot based on what happened to oil like the day before, the oil price the day before or something. So that was a a poor decision. But again, generally, they've navigated these things well. I don't think they're signaling that they're going to have a price war. If anything, it looks like they're signaling a very, like a potentially historic amount of cohesion. And um, I think that these news reports are just irritating them more, which actually increases the odds of cohesion. Because let's say you're UAE or Iraq or Kazakhstan or one of these other countries that has has some oil spare capacity that's proven that they could deliver into the market. You get these Western reporters in France or Houston or wherever talking about how you're terrible and you cheat all the time and you're not trustworthy. Um, You know, it's not so crazy to think that, hey, you want to sort of behave for economic and non-economic reasons to rebuild your credibility. And the data is showing that there's sort of more cohesion now than you've seen in a long time. And then there's one other data point that I think you'll find interesting. I wrote about this a few years ago, and people thought it was ridiculous. And then it actually sort of has been a pretty good indicator. Um, if you look at the the tanker rates ahead of um, ahead of OPEC meetings, one of the tells in 2014 is the Saudis went and bought absolutely crazy amounts <laughs> of tanker supply. Essentially, they got the contractual rights ahead of letting the market in 2014. And I didn't know enough. I lost tons of money on that. So again, like, you know, it's very, very tough to make these calls. And the reality is all of us make these calls wrong a lot. And it's just important to start with, hey, like, there's a good chance I'm going to be wrong about this. What can I do to improve my odds? So you look back, like I did with the shale stuff and just try to figure out, hey, what else have I gotten wrong? And like, what what would have what more can I look for? So if you look also in 2020, tanker rates went a little crazy, which it was it was odd that that happened because demand was falling because of COVID right. shutdowns and so on. So right now, tanker rates are not going crazy, even with the Red Sea essentially mostly shut down uh, with the Houthi attacks. So um, in the context of that, tanker rates are relatively low, and I think that should give people a lot of comfort. If you ignore everything else and you look at, hey, um, <laughs> you know, what are they saying? What's what's Reuters and Wall Street Journal, whatever else saying, Bloomberg, and um, and then you know, what are tanker rates doing? I think that's that should be pretty helpful in terms of figuring out what OPEC might do. Yeah, I, look, I got to respect. You know, I, I should I have a lot of respect for individuals that come out uh, and they talk about their wins uh, and the reasoning for their wins, and then also talk about where they made mistakes. Uh, and you also have to give credit to people that actually have a conviction and have the data to support their thesis, right? I mean, the thesis can be wrong, but if you have the data to kind of support it, um, then obviously you get a little bit more of a leg up than uh, some others that you know come out and maybe some of those investment things that we kind of talked about earlier that just kind of follow price and just throw throw a number out there uh, without any uh, real um, meaningful um, data or information to be able to back that up. Uh, so I, I, I got to give you mad respect for that. I, I know a lot of the viewers do too. Um, this will be the last question that I have, and then I'll, I'll kick it to Jason. I'll know um, if he has any, any questions here. Over the next 10 years, 15 years, and this is going to be a specific question, what are you more bullish on? 
LNG, not companies. I'm not talking about the energy companies, not LNG companies, but are you more bullish on liquefied natural gas and its application or crude oil on a global scale? What do you so, think so from a volume perspective, I think liquefied natural gas will certainly grow volumes much more than oil. I think there's almost no no question there. I think that's the consensus view. And it's just a question of, hey, will demand for LNG grow by five times the rate that oil demand grows or two times the rate or 10 times the rate? But the global demand for liquefied natural gas is voracious, as evidenced by demand growth, despite much higher prices today than you saw pre-COVID. So prices are very robust for liquefied natural gas and demand is very robust despite substantially increased supply. So I think that tells you that there's, I mean, that seems very likely to continue. The the other question I think that's sort of embedded in that is price. And I'm way more bullish on the price for oil than the price for liquefied natural gas for a variety of reasons. I think it's much easier to produce natural gas. There's much more identified natural gas in places where you can produce it, such as Appalachia, here in the US and West Texas and Southeast New Mexico, and then up in Alberta and British Columbia, there's just enormous amounts of gas and there's increased takeaway capacity. There's these LNG terminals that are getting built and there's more getting planned. And there was a permit moratorium for a year or so in the US here. It looked like sort of politically motivated, sort of complicated, uh, almost like a third rail type topic. But um, that seems to be ending right now and maybe is subject to an election outcome. Um, but it does seem like the, the longer term trend is way higher supplies for liquefied natural gas, lots of available supply that breaks even at, let's say, and meets sort of capital uh, cost requirements at, let's say, $3.50 or so in MCF from a supply perspective here, which would translate to a global price of, let's say, 7 or $8 in MCF, which is far lower. I guess, actually, it's getting closer to the oil prices, oil prices fall. But I think that's sort of a reasonable price to underwrite longer term, plus maybe a couple dollars for profits across that value chain for LNG versus oil, where there's much less supply available. The marginal cost of that supply is way higher. And it's just less clear who's going to do it. It's less clear where it comes from. And so even though there's less demand growth, I think the supply challenges for oil may substantially overwhelm that lower demand growth and lead to much higher prices from here. I appreciate that. Jason. I'll kick it to you. I, I've been hogging the mic, man. No, that was great. Um, you know, that that was the point of the discussion today. I have a high level breakdown between yeah. both of you guys, you know, because everybody hears my opinions all the time, but I want to hear your guys' opinions, you know, and especially going through and hearing jo what Josh does, kind of his framework and understanding. Uh, this has been awesome. So I just want to thank both of you guys for doing this. Uh, Josh, thanks for joining us. This was a lot of fun getting to hear you talk, getting to listen to you. And I'm sure the audience enjoyed it. We had a big audience today. We didn't have any questions because that was kind of a very high level breakdown. And that's what happens sometimes is you you answer so many things that there's just not really much to be said. And I think that was one of those. Um, it was well explained. I think everybody has a good view of what we're thinking in the energy market today. I also love the the one point you brought up earlier, which was oil trades. Uh, you said your buddy said this oil trades at the current market well you know the stock market kind of trades uh forward looking and i think that's uh incredibly important because when you're looking at the market and if i'm looking at oil and i'm looking at let's say oil's breaking down here let's say oil just continues to break down here over and over and over again there's probably something really under like the market's probably going to follow it at some point and the other way when oil starts to bottom and starts to trend up the market usually follows it at some point uh, especially stocks, obviously, the energy stocks, but even the broad market at a certain point. So it's kind of a very interesting um, that that was said earlier. So just want to thank you guys so much, uh, expanding my mind as well as our audience. And uh, thank you guys for joining us. And we'll see you guys soon. Please hit the notification bells on YouTube so you guys see when we're uh, going live. And uh, please follow the speakers. Please follow Josh. Please follow Kevin. Uh, these are great guys, obviously great follows. So we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate you having me on.